road to hell is paved with good intentions. But what if those intentions were more sinister from the beginning? I'm Nikki P, resident pop culture expert, here with utopian history expert Danny McCarthy. We're going to take a deeper look at the sci-fi movies that we love and see if maybe what we always thought were warnings were really blueprints. Join us as we pull at the crimson threads in our beloved cinema. Welcome to The Road to Hell. Welcome back, everybody, to The Road to Hell podcast. I am one of your hosts, Daniel McCarthy, and I am joined by my intrepid co-host, who I will allow to introduce himself. I like being introduced as intrepid. Let's just go with that. Hi, everyone. I'm intrepid. (laughs) Isn't that the name of some character from some movie that you probably have seen? A dozen Uh, times. It it absolutely is. I can't remember what it is offhand, though. Rats. All right. Well, (laughs) we'll ignore that faux pas then. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about, I think it's a 2019 movie. Something like that. Late 20 teens movie called Midsummer, which is all about a cult in Sweden, one of those kind of Scandinavian Nord- Nordic countries up there. Uh, so, yeah, that's what we're going to discuss. And I want to start this conversation just by asking, what were your general kind of broad brush takeaways from this movie? What were okay, your- so broad brush takeaways. Um, oh, f- screw you for making me watch this piece of crap. <laughs> uh, I had vowed never to watch this horrible movie because I, you know, being tuned into the horror horror uh, world, it definitely did not get uh, well-reviewed by people that I trust. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going to dodge this over two-hour-long bullet. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, I apparently had to watch this so that we can talk about cults and utopian societies. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I watched for that reason. Um, it was funny... Like the old real the things that excited me about this is that someone said, "Oh, it's a horror movie that takes place in the daylight," and then finding out that you're all like, "Oh, I didn't even know it was a horror movie. I just thought it was a trip, you know, some drama." Um, my expectations were definitely not high going into it. But thankfully, that at least tempered some of my reaction. Um, having watched the director's other work, Hereditary, I mean they all this suffers from all the same problems that does, which is mostly being way too long and you know not focusing on like real human reactions, like very very contrived situations. So, I mean, what 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 inspired you to make me watch this piece of crap? Just simply the face value fact that we're dealing with a hippie commune type of thing. It's just so almost too on the nose of a utopian movie to pass up, especially as we're still in like the early episodes of doing this. I thought this would be one that'd be easy to talk about the utopian elements of. And because it is so blatant and on the nose, I think it'd be easy to bring in and highlight the big, like in general utopian themes that Mm -hmm. just kind of exist in the abstract. Like we could talk about, how it's easy to sell because isn't everyone happy and isn't everyone pretty and isn't it nice that they're all singing all the time. And then of course there's the very obvious dark side to it. Uh, So, you know, it just, it's, it's a good non subtle highlight of utopianism. I I think I'm actually going to surprise you by questioning how you're the, the dark side thing that you have an issue with in it too. Mm. Um, Cause I actually, we'll cross the bridge when we get there, but. Okay. I'm curious. Yeah. Um, so face value, what you have here, it was described to me as a movie about a guy and a girl who go on vacation and he cheats on her and she's kind of crazy. And then he dies over the course of the movie. And that's kind of true. It ignores a lot of context, but that's the, the broad strokes of what happens here. Now, what really the movie is about is the cool exchange student in the friend group invites all of his buddies back to go see the the town he grew up in that he loves so much. And the girlfriend of one of the buddies just happens to tag along. And 
when we say just happens to tag along, it becomes very apparent very quickly that really this whole movie was very driven by the the character. Like, it seems like an, oh, just hey, come hang out with me, was very on purpose and for a very specific um, cultural reason, I guess we'll say. Mm-hmm. Um, that sounds about right so far. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I the the role of the exchange student friend, I think, is definitely something that you're right to point out. He's kind of like a fisher of men. He's a missionary, mm-hmm. right? His his role in the cult, where for people who don't know, I mean, there's this. I, I think they're Swedish, right? Is it Swedish? I think so. Uh, we'll go with that. If we're wrong, then oh well. Um, He's this Swedish dude who's living in America, going to grad school. And he's like, hey, come check out my commune where I'm from. And so his friends do. And uh, he's really, he's supposed to be this nice guy. He's really charming and everything. But really his role is to go out from the cult, find people, and then bring them in to effectively be sacrificed, either sacrificed or grafted into the cult as new blood. Uh, See... Even that's not being really like. I think the sacrifices are something that happens almost as a byproduct of how the whole thing works. Really, what they're trying to do. There's two things that they're trying to do. They're trying to bring in new people to the cult, mm-hmm. and because it is an insular society, that's why they drug him and have him fuck the one girl. Right. Because they can't. They they can only inbreed so much before it's a problem there's a cap well they they obviously have the one inbred child that kind of represents like the uh the jesus figure in the cult you know he's the one that writes the symbols and like does all the iconography for the let's say this utopian society um and it becomes very clear that like the one one guy is being groomed you mentioned in your memories of this movie, you just remembered it being, you kind of describe it almost like I remember uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Just a lot of right. drugs happening, and it's all just one big coked out, like crazy fest. Uh-huh. Um, but what's really going on is they're actively working to they find a vulnerable person. They're actively working to separate her from her friends. They're actively pouring on all of the affections of the community to draw her in. And so separate and bring in like, I mean, just, we're talking classic, classic, what cults do. Like if you go and read a textbook, this is exactly how they will tell you to operate. Yeah. Meanwhile, the guy, they go, they do the separate and then they also drug him and kind of like, well, he kind of still like, he was a pretty decent guy. He wanted to work on the relationship. Like, you know, even as manipulative as the girl was, like, she was damaged. I don't think she realized she was being manipulated, but she was manipulating the shit out of this dude. And as time goes on, like, they're pulling her away, and he wants to keeps trying to connect. But they keep putting him in a situation where he's not capable of acting on his own impulses until eventually they basically break him down until, well, she won't give me the time of day, and I have my needs, and I don't know what's going on really anyways. Just fucking roll with it, you know? And he ends up sleeping with, you know, one of the girls there who chose him when they all, when everyone walked into town because there's a couple other people that went out and were the missionaries and brought people back. And he was chosen to be the one that was going to help breed with this right. one particular girl. Well, so there's a lot in there. The At the very end, the high priest, I guess you'd call him, he does explain that part of their ritual so they're, they're doing this special sun ritual yeah. um, and it happens every 90 years, but it, I guess it's correlating with a yearly ritual because every year they pick this May queen, but yes. then every 90 years they do this extra special thing. And so they're going on at the same time. And uh, at the end, he says that specifically for this ritual, they need nine sacrifices. Four come from inside the cult, but four do have to come from outside. Do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the the sacrifices was actually central to okay. the guys going out, scouting people, and then bringing them back to be murdered. 
And then as to whether or not the last guy was sacrificed, um, the, the last, the ninth sacrifice could have either been someone from in the cult or outside. They leave it up to the May Queen, who happened to be this main character girl because she won a dance off. <laughs> um, and she was also on drugs, but not as much as the dude. But you, you laid out a lot there that's worth talking about, but I don't know if I could remember all of it or hit on all of it. But the one thing I will say is that I think that we got a, a very different impression as, t- as to the nature of the guy whose name is Christian, which I thought was probably not on accident that I, oh, yeah, I saw him. Obviously not at all. He was this like sh- kind of shitty, weak, lukewarm, tepid guy who was too afraid to oh no i end up to anyone around him he was i think think he wasn't trying to be malicious but he was yeah he was he was wishy-washy and refused to act on what he knew he wanted to do i don't think he was trying to be malicious but as so often happens you know you could be so goddamn lukewarm and so neutral that it you basically might as well have been malicious you know he as as manipulative as she is kind of being by accident he's just feeding into that the whole exactly. time he's a pussy he like steals his friend's thesis idea yeah that was just wild. he's so backhanded the whole and he's always playing dumb you're like oh i didn't realize well, you were doing your thesis on that but, that but if you also notice like yeah it's hard to blame that entire line him because clearly it, pay attention who was involved in all of that happening? Who clearly manipulated that situation into happening? Into uh, them coming together, you mean? The, the exchange? No, well, the exchange student actually kind of manipulated. He, was, he hadn't chosen anything. He manipulated right. that whole exchange into like them sharing into right. happening, which kind of put things to a head that the, other, the one guy's trying to like – trying to find how he's going to deal with like their group thing and it's – yeah, like, but th- 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 that's the thing. Like, when you look at it, there was a lot of construction going on this by this main character. This, you know, I want to see the main character. Like, I mean, he, to me, he is the main character. Like, as much as they want to tell you about it, it's about the guy and the girl. Yeah. More of this movie is really about this guy bringing these people in. And, like, while he's not always there, everything that's happening is because of him. Well, everything that happening is because of him because he is really just this sort of acting agent for the cult itself. No, absolutely. So, you know, he's kind of like this metaphor for the collective. Really, I would say the main character is the, the cult. cult. Yeah. It's the yeah. collective consciousness of the cult, and he's just kind of one little finger of that. And when you, uh, say, you say that now, yeah, no, yeah, that does make sense, because when it's not at him, it's one of the town elders, you know, one of the cult right. elders, or it's one of the other people. You know, there's a couple female characters in there that help guide the female character on her journey. They're always acting completely in sync, which raises the question, which I think the movie is implying pretty heavily that as you were kind of alluding to all of the events that we watched unfold in the movie were contrived. They were the intended actions of, or they're the intended steps of the ritual. Maybe not totally. Here's, there is one notable difference the one that really doesn't fit the bill. And it's where you, I think you do see a genuine crack. Mm-hmm. It's when the dude pisses on the tree. Yeah. I don't think that that was scripted. And that's why that one dude's losing his shit, ready to kill him. And everyone's trying to back him off. Like, no, 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 this doesn't work towards our greater goal. Right. I know this is a horrible affront, but we have to deal with it and let things unfold in our own course. And that guy ends up fucking dying. Obviously <laughs> most everybody dies in horrible, gruesome ways in this movie, like of the these characters, but they, they actually let give him the pass. So as to allow things to do what they need to do for the greater ceremony. I think that, so like specifics down to that actual level, like the act of that dude peeing was not scripted. However, I think that the ritual is kind of meant to highlight the differences between the outside world and the inside world Mm -hmm. and rely on those differences to justify the execution of the marks. So all of the, the people that were brought in from the outside, there were five of them, four of them wind up being killed. 
one of them winds up being grafted into the the cult as the May Queen. Or I'm sorry, there were there are five, six people brought in. Five of them. There's the, the guy and the girl. Like, so the five were killed, them. and then she becomes the the May Queen. Um, I think that all of the people who were brought in from the outside all expressed some sort of discomfort or they acted in some way that was against the tribe's wishes that justified them being killed in some way. So yeah, like the first guy who gets killed, uh, the, the cult, they have this basically suicide ritual for old people. You reach a certain age, you jump off a fucking cliff, right? It's all about recycling. Uh, so they do this and these English people, they start flipping out. And then like two days later, they're both dead, but missing. Like no one knows where they, they go. The, the Americans don't know where they go. Yeah. They're told that they left willingly, but then later well, they're found. Well, they're, they're told the one left and then the other one left later. Right. Because they didn't yeah. leave together. There's like there's yeah, they, a time lapse in there where she loses her shit, goes chasing after him. Mm hmm. And they try and convince her otherwise, and then they tell everyone, "Oh yeah, well we we like it was, brother came back and then took her out with you know him. They they they're on their boat. They're headed home, right? So and so they're they're leaving. The idea of them having left is predicated on the fact that they disagreed with the cult's actions. That's what it, what's able to kind of justify them vanishing. And then the later people who go missing, the one runs off with some chick, he goes missing, but then the other dude. He he's accused of so, stealing so, their book. So the runs off with some chick is maybe not the best way of doing it. He is lured <laughs> off very clearly. Like right, she she wants to show him something, needs help with something, and so she kind of and and it, obviously it's treated as oh he's just gonna go try and get some ass, and so we don't expect him to see him anytime in the future. But then after the other guy disappears, they say like oh our sacred text went missing. He was asking questions about it. He wanted to take pictures of it. So he probably stole it. Oh, and by the way, that other friend of yours who went with that girl yesterday, he disappeared too. So well, they you both remember stole the, You remember that the text didn't actually go missing, right? Right. Like, yeah, they, they faked they, it. They just said it went missing. Like they walked in on him taking pictures of it. Yeah. 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 I was just making but sure that we, was... didn't, we didn't miss that part. <laughs> yeah, no, that was right. all just bullshit. Like, yeah, they said that's what happened. And they used it to... They used it to take control of the situation with the people that were still remaining. Mm -hmm. Like it put them in a position of fear thinking that these people are watching us now. Right. You know, and it adds to the don't, don't slip up element of what's going on. Um, the real thing I think that drives like 90% of the interesting shit in this movie is the scene. You mentioned it where they're jumping off the cliff it's also, I think, one of the things where you, you, you're watching these people die, like suicide, whatever. And <clears throat> I think you mentioned, like, just, oh, this is just awful. You know, this is a terrible thing. These people see this terrible thing. But it reminds me of one of my old college professors wrote a book called Lucifer State. And the premise of Lucifer State is that everyone, you know, you don't get, you don't get a birthday. Like, you don't say, like, oh, I'm 30 years old. You you give your death date, and you're given that at birth. Now, obviously, people die of all sorts of reasons. So how do you give someone a death date? Well, you best have them kill themselves, right? Well, Something. essentially, there's a ritual baked into the society. There's no fear of it. It's just what you do and the idea of being, oh, I'm this is my time. I'm just going to go off. And, yes, they do kill people at that point in time. But... If this is the expectation, it, it, and this is how the culture works, is this really an evil act? Right. Which brings to mind the word cultural relativism. And cultural relativism is where I really, the mind blower of this thing to me was. And it's because it seemed so much like every academic person I've ever met. Yeah. You have all these six people, whatever they are, they're watching this ritual where people are killing themselves. And like w part of the other half of it is they take these giant hammers and smash these people to death if they like who didn't necessarily die. They're horribly maimed. But now they go they, there are people who actively go to kill them and like make sure that they die. 
And while the people were definitely affected and disagreed with this action, there was a certain amount of, oh, well, you know, it's just, it's just our culture. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know about you. Personally, I'm not watching people get murdered and my response be, oh, it's just part of their culture. Right. Whether or not that may actually be true. They're just different. And and to me, it was a it was a great example of like a particular class of people. Like you'll say the academic class. Like how their value system works. I thought it was really exemplary of that. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the the two, well, again, who's the main character? The the boyfriend of the girl who becomes the May, May Queen, who I guess is, she's the protagonist, I guess, technically, probably. If we're but, doing horror movie structure, she's the protagonist. Yes. Yeah. So her boyfriend, Christian, and this friend of theirs, um, the, the one who goes missing for supposedly stealing the sacred text, these guys are both anthropologists or trying to become anthropologists in college. So the reason they're there, the whole pretext for them coming is that we're going to study these people. I'm going to write a paper on them. So right there, we have that academic lens, like everything is permissible because this is a laboratory. And that t- takes us back to utopianism in general too, which exactly. is exactly utopias are always built sort of synthetically they don't arise organically uh as if the society being built is taking place isolated and in a sort of laboratory this happened in the united states uh right before the civil war there were all these communities that would break off and just kind of start from scratch and the the nation became for a moment a, a nation of laboratories in different ways of having a society go and uh that's kind of the case in this movie. And so now we've got these Western academics coming in and actually treating it as such. And so that for that therefore justifies them saying, well, sure, we just watched an old man and an old woman fall 200 feet or whatever to their death. And the one dude got his head bashed in by a big old mallet. But that's, you know, that's fine. It's their culture. Boy, won't this make a great paper. Exactly. You know, That's uh, and uh, there's the underlying concept, I think, especially running between those two male characters uh, status, you know, like going back to the world, proving ourselves. Mm -hmm. The one guy is very uh, not the boyfriend. The other dude is very excited about what this uh, means to him for his career. And then, of course, Christian, the dude just kind of piggybacks on that because he's a scumbag. Um, So the other thing that I think is kind of interesting about this is that, and this also says a lot about, once again, a certain class of people, is that they're watching this unfold before them and surprisingly not afraid for themselves. Like, they they just accept, oh, they just, these people just kill themselves. Like, they kill each other. We're clearly not in any real danger for ourselves here. They even act poorly by like our culture standards, not even pushing you know how badly they act for this culture standards, and they never really seem like they're afraid of retaliation in any way. You know, I guess they just see them as oh these these crazy hippies they're just living their crazy hippie life. Even yeah. after these people fucking brutally murder people in front of them, like it's like hey let's broadcast that we're murderers and see if these people get it. <laughs> Right. Right. Yeah. That strikes me as odd as well. I think that probably the natural response to a murder would be to immediately vacate the place, regardless of how, you know, encouraged you are for your anthropological studies. Like, you know, even, even the dude who really wants to learn about this culture is probably gonna think twice. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm not a goddamn academic. I can't get into those people's minds, but I can at least imagine Says the guy but... surrounded by books who reads shit from a hundred years ago. <laughs> now I'm not an yes, academic. I don't have I a don't degree. That is. I don't have a degree and that makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> I do this of my own free will and I don't get paid. So yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Get this thing off the ground one day, but uh, no, like you said before, I think it was while we were recording 
a lot of the human emotion in this movie seemed contrived. Mm -hmm. Didn't really seem like the way most people would respond. Um, except ironically, I guess the, uh, the May queen who's, what was her name? Her name's Danny. Yeah. Danny. Yes. That always drives me crazy. Someone's got my name in a movie. Anyway, she, uh, she seemed to be the one out of the Americans who was actually most disturbed by the suicide because I don't think we mentioned this yet. The movie opens with her entire family dying in a murder suicide. Uh, her sister is depressed and she basically hooks up the, uh, the mufflers of her parents' cars to run hoses of carbon monoxide into her room and into her parents' room. So Danny, it, when she sees these two, once again, this director suicides. really likes oh, crazy, contrived, yeah. not realistic at all scenarios. Like it's much of what the our other movie Hereditary is like. Yeah, there is it, nobody who is going to pull off that murder suicide. It was just bad. It looked terrible and looked yeah, well, oh, also and it was impossible. 12, it was a twelve-minute reveal. Yeah, I yeah, for all that, like I counted the opening intro before you actually get the the title card is twelve minutes long, and that whole twelve minutes is building to the reveal that there was this suicide. So she's triggered by the suicides in this place. Um, well, this with everything. So know? this movie, we easily could have lost an hour of runtime and actually been probably a better movie. We could have achieved all of the goals because really, what was the point in that whole twelve minute reveal? We have a damaged person here. That's the that's the message they needed to get across. She right. was damaged goods because she had some trauma in her family. I think he could have gotten that a lot quicker. <laughs> yeah, and it also goes to show, which could have been done quicker, that she's isolated. You know, her peer group, whatever, yes. I guess that's what we call it nowadays. The people around her who are her contemporaries uh, don't particularly care for her. Her boyfriend, as I said, is lukewarm he's not very passionate about his relationship with her uh when he's talking to his friends you kind of get the impression that he's talking about like sort of kind of how he wants to break up with her but like can't you know yeah you get that impression his none of his friends like her except for the creepy scandinavian dude um but <laughs> the rest of them are, are kind of done with her so she's damaged and she's alone Exactly. And one other thing that they show in that opening, which I think they dropped the ball and not bringing back up or at least clarifying. They show her taking some sort of pills. And I would have liked for them to have addressed whether or not she was still taking those that whatever that medicine was while she was in the cult, because that's you know an her, old, loose her, her mood stabilizers. Right. Like, does that play into this or what? They just kind of left it. They didn't tell us if well, she brought with her or actually, what. I was gonna say, but more likely she's not like she's not getting those. Like she's she's off her meds. Well, this is all probably going on, making her once again more susceptible to how like the cult work. And like I said, textbook how cults operate. Yeah. They find a weak person, they separate them from the people that care about them, like they, and they actively take them away from their their support network. And then they insert themselves as the new support network. And, and like, so there's the actual reveal when she, like, looks in as Christian is having, is going through the ritual, the sex ritual or whatever it is. It's him in a room full of, like, 20 women. They're all nude. And they're, like, like literally to the point of moving his hips because he's so drugged. Yeah. Like, and they're making him fuck this little, this little girl. And... She just happens to see it, loses her shit, and just starts sobbing and bawling. And then what happens? Literally every woman in the in the in the commune, the cult, whatever, surrounds her and begins wailing and sobbing with her and taking on her her emotional level onto themselves to try and like to show her the support. Yeah, and they do this. Go ahead. No, it just like you said, it's textbook. You really can't. To, you, you couldn't illustrate it any better yeah it's um they do this a number of times in the movie where they particularly the women 
they collectively lean into whatever emotional pain is going on. Actually, no, I take that back. Uh, they're, the men do it too, because when the, the old man jumps off the cliff in the suicide ritual and he doesn't die, his legs are just broken and he's you know lying and writhing in agony. All of the people in the cult start screaming and ripping their clothes and freaking out, matching where he's at. And uh, there's, uh, there's another time in the movie, at least one other time, where they, as a group, all do the same thing. And again, mm -hmm. This speaks to this idea of the collective consciousness. This cult doesn't really pay mind to the concept of individual, which I think is probably why it's pretty easy to kill motherfuckers yeah. um, because they're all supposed to be this one system. So whenever someone's in agony, well, we're all in agony mm -hmm. and they, they do that collective leaning into pain. And I think that that serves as a technique almost to, if we all lean into the problem, we all experience it. We all kind of even exaggerate the issue. We can absolve ourselves of responsibility because we don't. It's all out in the open. Whatever I did, quote unquote, wrong is experienced by all of us. So who is there to shame me? Who is there for me to feel guilty around? It's done. And so I can kind of get away with anything. I think that's probably a, a psychological trick to kind of cope with the, the very animalistic reality of realizing that, hey, we're killing people. Shouldn't I feel fear? Yes, let's all feel fear together and then get over it and kill another fucking guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's my impression anyway. No, I mean, that, that, that tracks with me too. So, um, I mean, long story short, like, this one was not was not the movie that, like, say, The Circle was where it's just jam packed with like concept after concept and like history on top of history, just being wedged into this, this one movie. There was, we said it was, it was interesting in that you're watching, you know, the utopian society. Um, I'm curious through your reading, you've I've actually read about specific, specific societies. Was there any of them that it really reminded you of? Well, I already referenced before the, the ones that arose in the United States, say between 1815 so it's funny and it's like you have the knowledge of like the utopian movements and like i actually have to me they weren't utopian movements when i was reading about a lot of places what they were called was uh, they were spiritualist towns yeah <laughs> i got real into spiritualism and like you know spooky shit like that mm -hmm. um so I did a lot of reading on that. Like I also grew up like really close to Lilydale. But it, one of the things is like all of these like towns, so many of them tracked also as utopia, actively utopian communes, uh, through in that particular time in history. It's I, I think that it's really interesting, and I did a show um, uh, in pursuit of utopia with Brett Vinat and myself. At this point, probably two, maybe three years ago, uh, just on these kinds of utopian colonies. Mm -hmm. It's actually in the School Sucks podcast feed for anyone who wants to find it. But um, it, was, it was Kevin Cole did that one with you, right? No, this was the was one we one? did right before he joined us. Yeah, this. so it's just me and Brett. Oh, I want to say we did it towards the end of 28, 2019. Towards the end of 2019, it must have been. But uh, there there was a whole number of these that arose mostly before the civil war, which I think is an interesting time in American history. It's before this sort of overweening union, uh, United American government as one thing. There is still this idea of regional autonomy that's circulating. So I wouldn't even really point to any one of these in particular. I'd just say the whole lot of them, because at that point in time, you know, a lot of the United States was still, fairly open wilderness woods that sort of thing not controlled by some urban center so people would just grab their stuff hike off into the woods and put to the test their wacky utopian ideas yeah uh and the big one i guess i could reference is called new harmony mm -hmm. in indiana which was started by robert owen who's some scotsman who came over here he's the guy who came up with the idea of an eight-hour work week He's the guy who coined the term socialism. He 
made a factory town. He brought in all kinds of, I'm not even going to get into it here, but um, there's this idea of human beings constructing a society that works in tune with nature, but their idea of nature is kind of read through a political lens that they already want to apply a priori, you know, because it's easy to say like, oh, nature ordains this or that. It's like, all right, well, how do you really know? And how do you know that you're not just kind of molding your view of nature to fit what you want to be the case? Yeah. There's, there seems like there's always a, the danger of that. Oh, for sure. You know, there's a couple hours south of us. There's actually Utopia, Ohio. It's an actual town. Um, it's word? abandoned. I'm pretty sure, but it's not my. <laughs> it's not my favorite abandoned town. <laughs> uh, yeah, ironically, it's a band. Like they're all all of these things. All these societies were complete disasters. Unless you want to, the, the Amish, they popped up around this time period, and they're still going, and. I have an argument for why, but we won't get into that. They're, they're, they have their elements of their culture. I wouldn't wish upon my own also. So right. <laughs> well, that. Exactly. Um, um, in particular, but, the way they treat their women in certain aspects. Yeah. But with them being the exception, all these little utopian communes fell apart. Kind of like uh, in the sixties, you know, the hippies mm. wanted to do that kind of thing. And where are they now? Well, that was the thing that really think was wild. So you, your most recent episode to the recording of this of your podcast, um, I, I that's one of the things that was really interesting to me. I want to put this. Um, how intertwined the, we'll say, like the '60s psychedelic movement, kind of tied into the utopian idea and like the types of ways that people wanted to live their lives and then how that translated into the let's say the cyber cyberpunk kind of world for sure <laughs> um and those different utopian societies <laughs> but um yeah uh, the the other thing i really wanted to bring up while we still had you here uh Aside from like actual specific um, societies, you thought it might have resembled. Did you uh, you notice any specific iconography? Um, there wasn't a ton, but there were like certainly if you look at the buildings, um, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of symbolism in. You have what is a very small community, but if you noticed everything that they had there building wise, was very big. They sat in a great. Like, they they all slept in a great hall. It's two floors. The rooms open. You know, eventually when they they kill, um, they give off the sacrifices and they burn the guy alive in the bear suit. <laughs> they bear like he's burned alive in this giant, you know, pyramid shaped building. Um, and when they go under, when they walk into the town for the first time, it's beautiful, and you walk underneath these giant these giant poles so like for the level of technology they have they have these great buildings just tucked into this little this little place um you know there's there definitely seemed like there was some psychological cues that they were trying to give off you know in, in that I, I i i cite one of my friends who said you know said it's easier to see how the uh catholic church managed to run the world for so long if you go to spain because you just see all of these gigantic, enormous, imposing stone churches and cathedrals. Many of them took like took hundreds of years to build. And it's like you th it's funny when you think about that next to technology today. It's like you know, can you imagine starting a building that you're not gonna, you won't be able to see your 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 kids might finish building the building. <laughs> yeah, we don't work that way anymore. <laughs> yeah very impermanent in our, our design mm -hmm. but the one thing that we do still keep with us is we love huge huge yeah. as a structure it's imposing psychologically on the people around us you know when you look at uh, government buildings they're always grand because they want to impose on the people their own importance why do we build 
giant fucking stone monuments. Why is the Washington Monument a giant? <laughs> Why is it a giant phallus? Well, because we're trying to tell you, you got to pay attention to us. We're right. in charge here. Um, but was there, was there anything like aside from that that you noticed specifically or that kind of really called out to you in this? Well, um, aside from that, there wasn't very much. I think that that was really the major symbolic contribution of the movie. Um, and I do have some comments on that, but there were, a, there were two other things. There was the, at the beginning, before they even go off to the cult, we're inside of Danny's apartment mm -hmm. and she's got this bizarre painting on the wall, which they, they didn't show it for very long and they never centered on it. So you kind of just have to see it peripherally, but it seems to depict a woman naked running through some sort of wooded area or swamp. It's all green. Um, and it looks like the ground she's running on is wet and coming out of that wet ground appear to be the bodies of babies. Uh, so I thought that was remarkable. Uh, maybe they weren't babies. Maybe they were adults. It seemed to be human figures that were smaller than her, kind of bubbling up from the ground as she was just running in fear. Uh, it looked like she was being pursued. And uh, I thought that that was an interesting, perhaps, element of foreshadowing that you know we're going into the sort of realms of the unknown parts of nature the scary dreaded underworld um you know or like the archetype of the forest at night um that seemed to me to be presaging that and i guess conversely when they actually did get to the cult the entrance into the actual community was a gigantic sun gate yes which is fairly, you know, you could tell <laughs> there's some pagan symbology to a gigantic archway that's got sun rays, sun rays beaming out of it. You know where you're going. You're going into a, an, an area where they're essentially proclaiming that the sun is their god. Mm -hmm. uh, the sun is their the giver of life, you might imagine them saying. And the incidentally, the the pyramid building not only is it shaped like a pyramid, but it's yellow. yellow or golden. And in that case, well, the pyramid in Egyptian times um, was apparently a sun symbol. People point to like on the back of your dollar bill, there's the pyramid with the eye on top of it. The eye in Egypt was a symbol of the sun god, Ra. We talked mm -hmm. a little bit about this in the circle episode too, with Ra, the eye of Ra. So the symbol, the, the pyramid being a sun symbol reflects the, the art, the entryway. So the entryway into the cult is a sun gate. And the, I guess, exit point uh, for some people anyway, is through the pyramid in that the pyramid is burnt and they are killed. So uh, the one other the element of the architecture that stood out to me was as far as I noticed, all of the buildings tended to be a sort of convex triangular pyramid shape, except mm -hmm. for the, the banging room. The, the building where Christian uh, has intercourse with the young lady, that building is concave. The roof, go, it's like a V, which I think is probably some sort of symbolic representation of the masculine versus the feminine. Uh, tradition, traditionally, symbolically, the upward pointing triangle is a symbol of the man and the upside down triangle or V is a symbol of the woman. And you can imagine why. Well, that's actually interesting. You mentioned that because if I remember correctly, like the no men were in there, even the men like in the cult that were there, they covered their faces. Right. Like they didn't look in there. Like it was very much the, the room was full of women but there are no men around other than basically there. I mean, it's another example. They're just handing this guy off to be a sacrifice to the situation. And yeah, you know, and he's not really even there, you know, his, yeah. he's been drugged with multiple substances. Like I said, point. he's so heavily drugged that like they have to move his hips for him to fuck this girl. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it really is like the domain of mother nature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the theme of Mother Nature is, of course, featuring very prominently in this movie as well, in that 
on the surface level, you know, it's all nice. And uh, you, you enjoy the sorts of benefits of being out in the woods. Everything's clear. Everyone's happy and singing and having a nice time. But then also there's this constant theme of consumption, right? Mm. Mother nature eats all of her babies, yes, all of them. And <laughs> they, towards the end, you really get to see that played out where, uh, you see the leg of the one guy just sticking up out of the garden. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that? Um, you know, absolutely. I'm trying to think. There's actually, if I remember correctly, I think they do. Well, didn't they have a scene where a bunch of them were sticking out at one point? Were there? I only remember I, the I, one. That I might be making up in my head. But maybe it was just like, I remember that because that one scene was just so poignant. Like, oh. Yeah. That's when it's right after Christian gets through banging that lady. Um, he runs outside. He's freaking out. He sees his friend's leg sticking up in the pumpkin patch. And uh, then he runs into this room and he finds the first guy who went missing is like completely gutted. They've got him suspended and his lungs are pulled out of his back, like a, like looking like butterfly wings. Mm -hmm. And they appear to be, still breathing or something they're moving yeah, no it was, which I was not pleasant which no. i will say uh that was the only good part of this movie is it was it didn't play around with its graphic imagery and if you're a horror person like you, i'll take that as a win um the the narrative was super confused people didn't act the way people are supposed to act be more probably not even the way that people are supposed to act, but the way that people do act in these situations. Um, so it's, it was a diff it was definitely difficult for me to stomach the whole fucking movie. But, but it, like I said, there were a few interesting things, like, pieces of insight that I think made it worth watching. And I say worth worth watching on our end. I'd recommend none of you watch this. Just take what cool <laughs> shit we said about it and like let that be the case. <laughs> Because I don't, I don't want to, I don't want you angry at me when you go. I've lost two and two hours and seventeen minutes of my life to this nonsense. It is long. It is a, it is a long um, presentation for sure. Like I said before we started, I really think a lot of the suspense could have made a, a larger impact had they actually shortened. It. There's there's such a lead up to a lot of the really intense stuff actually happening that, you know, it, you kind of lose interest in the build up because it's just going for too long. Mm -hmm. You know, you're like, all right, I don't what's what's this even about? And then suddenly there's people jumping off the cliff. Um, <laughs> Pretty much. There could have been more of that, I guess, is what I'm saying. They spent too much of it was the slow burn. I think it would have done nicely had they added just a couple more like really intense punctuations. Um, more gore, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah. So uh, any last minute points you want to get in before we let people go? Oh, let's see. Um, well, I would just reiterate that this movie, I think it does a good job of really distilling the kind of utopian impulse that mm -hmm. I'm actually kind of looking for in my, my other work. Uh, it's never in history, generally speaking, except maybe with the exception of, of certain communities uh, in the uh, 19th century United States, with those exceptions aside, generally the utopias that pop up are never so blatant. I mean, there's always some some more subtle aspect to it. It's never so on the nose. But in this movie, that shit is on the nose. It's very clear what's going on. Yeah. They're, you're being brought into this place. Everyone's wearing the same clothes. It's completely homogenous. It's, it's unbelievable that these characters didn't immediately be like, whoa, I'm getting the fuck out of here. Because... Anybody who's grown up in modern America, who's at all familiar with any sort of cult or cult movie, uh, anything about cults would have gotten hell out of there day one yeah. because there's just no way, no way are you going to fall for this. And so that's uh, unfortunately utopias when they pop up in real life. It's not always so obvious 
to people as it should have been to the characters in this movie that what they're getting into is bad news. Mm. So basically the moral of the story is just because everything seems nice doesn't mean you're not going to be disemboweled. I should hope not. Disemboweling sounds terrible. It does, especially if they leave you alive <laughs> afterwards. So, well, right on, folks. I uh, hope you enjoyed us having a look at this movie, Midsummer. Uh, I'm deciding that uh, our next episode, that we're going to be looking at the movie Strange Days, starring, I believe, Angela Bassett and Rafe Fiennes from the 90s. Hell yeah. Uh, um, it is uh, an interesting movie, technologically speaking, because it... You definitely get into the nature of what makes a person a person on this one, because essentially people are handing around like the, the drug of currency in this this world is actually human memories and like human experience. So like that, I like when they were talking about it in the circle about people being able to share their lives and stuff like that. One of the lives that you know you get shared in this movie is a person is a guy who gets killed. And so, like, what kind of what kind of experiences are you really allowed to have and monetize things like that? Uh, I thought that it, it would open up a bunch of little wormholes for us to dig into, so I'm pretty pumped about it. Nice, yeah, it sounds good. You know, I love getting into that tech stuff. <laughs>